Okay, you're live. Hi, everybody. My name is Jeff Green, president of Green Team Realty. Thank you for joining us for the March 2020 housing market update. One month ago on the February 2020 housing market update, things were going great. The stock market was nearing all-time highs. One month later, the coronavirus has set in and everything is different. We're in historical times right now. So let's try to break it apart, figure it out, and figure out how this thing's going to keep moving forward. We have a great panel set up for us today. We have a mortgage expert. We have a financial expert. So tune in here with me right now. All right. So um, let's start with some positives. All right. Um, we're going to take a look at the mortgage side of things. Um, so the sil probably the biggest silver lining that we have is that mortgage rates are so low and there are lots of good programs for people to uh, be able to, to secure financing for a home that they want to purchase. You can see here by this chart going all the way back to 2016, you know, over this four year period of time, just how historically low the rates are. Okay. And right now things are kind of fluid because what's happening is the central bank, the Fed is, you know, determining their 10 year treasury rates. Those are constantly in flux. And as you can see from this chart, uh, you know, there is a correlation between the 10 year treasury rate and the, and the 30 year mortgage rate, but they are not one and the same. Uh, Laura Moritz is here with us today. She's a mortgage professional that we've been working together for many, many years. One of the great ones. And uh, she told me this morning as we we're preparing for this um, presentation that people need to, you know, be reminded that what you're seeing out there in the news with treasury rates, 0%, this, that, the other thing, that does not translate to mortgage rates, okay? They are not one and the same. So you have to really reach out to your mortgage professional in order to really truly understand what the rates are for your current financing situation. All right, uh, another positive that we had going for us, uh, which will hopefully carry us through this tough time that we're staring down here is the fact that 2020 came really firing out of the gates as opposed to 2019. One of the companies uh, that provides one of the uh, most important services for the real, real estate industry is showing time. They basically handle the, uh, the nuts and the bolts of the actual showings that realtors book on listings. So they, they are at you know, the ground level of showing data and they were showing big increases at the start of this year. So it showed that 2020 was off to a great start and there was a lot of pent up demand. So I see that as a positive because if we can get through this, you know, period of time where essentially our population is, is in halt, uh, that should bode well for us. Now we're going to take a look at, uh, oils, uh, crude prices, which, is a little bit of a mixed bag, okay? It's a positive, the, the fact that we've had the single largest decline, we have Ken Ford here with us as well. He's my personal financial advisor and one of the good ones in our territory. Uh, Ken just said as we were warming up for the, um, the uh, housing market update here, that this was the single biggest drop that we saw from January of 20 to where we are now in the history of crude oil prices. Now. It's just interesting that this happened uh, because basically what's going on is there's a battle between the crown prince of Saudi Arabia and Putin over in Russia. They're essentially, you know, trying to make power plays here and they're pushing production and they're bringing more oil into the marketplace in a global economic environment where oil is not needed. Hence the reason why crude prices are plummeting right now. So the positive of that is that we all potentially pay less at the pump, pay less to heat our homes. The negative side of this is that all of the companies involved in the oil industry stand a chance to go out of business to fall. And ultimately that impacts the banks that are financing their operations, which ultimately, obviously we know that banks are very important uh, for the housing market, because without them lending money, the housing market just is not going to move. So we have a potential contagion here as well that we need to be aware of. So the CDC, uh, the White House working together, uh, for those of you who might have tuned in to the White House uh, 
update that they gave on the whole situation for um, the coronavirus yesterday. You know, I watched the whole thing. It started at 3.30, and I really watched carefully because, obviously, I have a lot of, you know, invested into the real estate market and where things are headed. This is my livelihood. This is what I do. And, you know, uh, I kind of got the sense that they – they think this is going to be this halt of movement is not going to be over anytime soon. Um, I think a lot of school districts, a lot of local business leaders, politicians are saying, you know, for the next few weeks, this is going to happen. But I think the reality is uh, that this halt of movement is going to be prolonged until this virus can truly be contained and truly come down, you know, down on a, on a downtrend from a statistic standpoint. So what does that mean? We need to find a way to operate respectfully, responsibly, responsibly, so that we can keep the housing market in check, not experience a complete crash, but yet be respectful of what's going on with this virus. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Take a look at the Dow Industrial Average. Um, you know, I watch the Dow pretty much every day. It's a good indicator of the stock market as a whole and also kind of where our economy is headed. Um, just remarkable. I mean, if you look back to, you know, I unfortunately grabbed the screenshot when I covered that up there. But, you know, in the February housing market update, I mean, the Dow was literally lingering between 29,000 and 30,000. It was bouncing back and forth. And if you had listened to that update, basically what what the takeaway was, was that 2020 is going to be another great year, provided that we don't have any sort of global economic crisis. And, that, and during that housing market update, one of the things that I focused on was this coronavirus. And I said, you know, this thing really has the potential to do some serious damage globally. And within a couple of days of that housing market update, you know, Iran got the virus and Italy got the virus. And, and it just it just absolutely proliferated from there. Um so it's just remarkable to see what's happening out there and how fast. I mean, one month ago is not a lot of time, but yet our global economy is in standstill mode. One other big thing that not a lot of people are talking about, and thank you to um, James Fitzgerald, who is always looking out for me. He emailed this over to me because he thought it was interesting, something that I should be aware of, and I emailed this over to Ken. We've been talking about this. Um, Carl Icahn, he's a billionaire investor, um, and he is really betting on the fact that the commercial real estate market is in a bubble and it is about to crumble. And that is a big deal because obviously banks are heavily involved in commercial real estate and lending. So we have to watch this. We have to be careful of this because um, basically what you saw over the last several years here, uh, WeWork is the perfect example, okay? WeWork is a concept where they essentially buy up or lease out large amounts of commercial space and they're breaking it up into smaller chunks so that entrepreneurs or companies can buy flexible workspace. And the reality is, is that WeWork, uh, the CEO of WeWork and the founder did a really good job of pitching potential investors and raising a ton of money while not really focusing too much on the business model side of things to make sure that it was really going to work out. And we basically have seen an implosion with uh, WeWork's valuations and uh, how things were playing out in, in real life. Now, it, I, I just as an aside, it was fascinating. I, I was traveling through Europe over the summer of 2019, and there was a WeWork right next to the hotel that we were in. And for a week, we were in Dublin. Uh, maybe four or five days actually. And I'm walking by the WeWork uh, building and there was never anybody in there. It was just amazing to me. Uh, so that was the first sign for me to say, wait a second, what is going on here? Are these guys actually making money? Is there any sort of traction with this business? So something to keep an eye on the commercial real estate bubble. All right, let's take a look at our local stats here real quick because these are going to be more and more important as this goes on, even from a local level it will be important to watch these local stats because the real estate market really is so interconnected in the U.S. here. So Orange County actually came out of the gates lower than the last five years, uh, 258 units for the month of February, but it did come out higher than all of the months for January. So usually you'll see that in the beginning of the year, one month's a lot higher than the other. So when you average the two out, it's, it's right in the mix there. 
So nothing too concerned for those two months, nothing too big to be concerned about in those first two months, but it's going to be very interesting to track these units sold as we go along here. We may very well see a dip here. Hopefully we see a big spike as the year goes on, uh, but we shall see. Uh, sales price came out uh, way ahead of where we were before. Again, lack of inventory, right? We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Average asked to sold ratio. Where were things last listed versus where they sold? Very high level. This means on average, sellers are only were only negotiating about three percentage points off of their sales price on average. Days on market, how many days is it taking to sell homes? You can see that there was actually an uptick, which means uh, usually a slowing in the market a little bit. So you're seeing things, you know, regardless of, and, and again, these are at the close of February. So this is kind of pre-coronavirus situation. Uh, things were maybe slowing just a little bit, right? Sussex County, again, kind of a mixed bag, uh, not quite as high as 2018, a little bit higher than 2019. So right in the middle there, as far as units sold, average price, it was up, again, similar to what you saw in Orange County. Asked sold ratio, about the same, you know, 97%. Days on market, uh, again, not the lowest. You see all these years, days on market kind of trending down. You can see now things are kind of trending up there as well. All right, so let's, let's get into the phase of what are we going to do about this as real estate professionals, okay? Because... You know, people listening to this, maybe you're a homeowner, maybe you're a potential buyer, maybe you're a realtor. Um, you know, look, we need to take this thing seriously. Uh, what I what I loved, what one of the, the doctors on the White House update was saying yesterday is that, you know, this is all about protecting the greatest generation, right? The people that were in the World War II era, they're now elderly. These are the people that are dying from this disease, and we owe it to them to be responsible to slow things down, to take pause in our lives, to make sure that we're doing the right thing. That's 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 the right thing to do. Uh, that's the least that we can do. So we want to make sure that we're watching the WHO, World Health Organization, the CDC guidelines. We want to make sure that we're operating within those confines. Okay. Now, uh, some countries are shutting down. Others are not. I uh, listened very carefully to the CDC and all the doctors that were on the podium with President, President Trump yesterday and the, uh, the uh, update that they gave. And my takeaway from the whole thing is no more group meetings. If you are feeling symptoms and you do have the virus, you must quarantine, not just yourself, but your whole household. Okay. And I think that's really good advice. So if you're a realtor out on the trail and you've got this thing, you have got to stop. Do not, do not show homes, do not pretend that you're, you know, asymptomatic, so on and so forth. You got to take that seriously. For those who are asymptomatic, uh, who are not, uh, you know, um, contagious, have the virus, so on and so forth, you can operate, okay? You can operate responsibly. So here's what my recommendations to my realtors in the green team offices are, is let's tell our sellers who may be concerned about buyers coming into their homes that we can do personal tours of those homes, that we can greet the buyer and their buyer agent at the door and maybe even do a quick screen, have a quick conversation with them, see how they're feeling and see what's going on. If we want to make a quick judgment call to not let them in because we feel like there's some sort of virus at play, you know, you can make a game day decision. That's really up to the seller, how, how they want to control that situation. It is their private property. They have the right to do what they want with it. But, we should be walking them around the home. We should be opening any door. We should be opening any closet, closing things. Let's, you know, there's a way to do this responsibly so that we can continue to operate and keep the housing market going. Okay. So be there for the showings, open the doors, close the doors, give booties, so on and so forth, so that we can do this in a responsible way and keep things going. The next thing is we have an, a remarkable opportunity with video tours. Okay. Uh, there are, at least a handful of real live examples in green team, which is one agency of two offices in this huge real estate market. So if we've got some, there's probably hundreds of thousands of others where buyers never physically saw the home that they bought. They just did it through video. Their realtor was boots on the ground, walking them through doing as many showings as they needed to through video conferencing. It's a real opportunity and it works. Uh, you can show these homes if the buyers just don't want to come out. Maybe they have a medical condition. 
They're under quarantine, but they want to keep things going because they have to move. They want to move. They want to try to capitalize on, on this unique opportunity that we're in right now because it truly is a unique buying opportunity. Video can get it done. And the last thing that I want to say before we open it up to the panel is that, folks, we will prevail, okay? I have been very concerned about a some sort of global economic crisis for years now because I've been watching the stock market that happens. Ken, we're going to talk to him in a little bit. Ken and I for years have been talking about when this, you know, uh, these policies of the central banks, printing money, when it's going to catch up, and, and here we are, okay? But I can tell you one thing, and I learned this by going through the financial crisis from 2008 till 2016. We will prevail. We will come out of this. We don't know how long this is going to take. We don't know what this particular, you know, global crisis is going to do, but we will come out of it, and we just all have to hang in there and keep working because better times are ahead, that's for sure. So stay positive. That's the big thing. Now, some housekeeping real quick before we open it up to the panel. Uh, join us Tuesday, April 21st. That's the next housing market update for April. You can always stay tuned by going to greenteamrealty.com slash HMU. And a special thanks to really our sponsor, the Real Estate Referral Community, opening up very soon to all sorts of professions that service the real estate industry. More to come on that. Okay. Um, so I guess... Let's start with our realtor panelists, okay? In fact, let me let me introduce everybody. I'm, I'm looking at the screen here. I think that we have everybody on uh, gallery mode. So I'm gonna look at, I'm gonna work left to right as far as I can see it. Ken Ford, you can just wave your hand there. Ken is with Warwick Valley Financial Advisors. Laura Moritz is to my left. Laura is with Classic Mortgage. Uh, again, Ken, Laura, great people. They've been in their respective businesses businesses for a long time. They both made it through the financial crisis like me. We have a lot of good advice and a lot of good experience to give to get through this next thing that we're headed into. So uh, thank you both for being here. Now let's talk about Green Team Real Estate, uh, Green Team Realty people. Christy Anderson from Green Team New Jersey Realty. How you doing, Christy? Thanks for being here. Karen Gonan from Green Team New Jersey Realty and Angela Murphy from Green Team New York Realty. All right. Uh, ladies of the real estate sales profession, let's talk to you. What's going on with showings? I'm, I'm looking for boots on the ground. Uh, are people continuing to want to see homes? Are they canceling all of their tours? Where are we at with that? Uh, Christy, you go first. I'm still getting lots of showings on my properties. And I had, personally, I showed um, eight different prospects homes this weekend. So, wow is it is very busy still at this point great that's great news to hear that really is karen what about you so i actually had two cancellations over the weekend and i was thinking hey you know weekend off woohoo haven't done that in a while and then i got calls from brand new clients just looking to see houses i actually met christy at one of the listings as well so It's been busy, and even yesterday, I showed one set of clients over eight properties. So it's still going, that's for sure. Awesome. Murph, what do you got? Yeah, I would agree that um, not only are they viewing homes, they're purchasing homes. Two of my clients, I had 10 homes on with both of them. Out of both, six had accepted offers just in one week. and I just thought we're still moving quickly. So I advise my buyers. Great. I would like to add to that if possible too. I'm at, yes. I'm writing two contracts today. Good. That's great news. So you know what's an interesting fact is that the housing market in total, meaning the sales of it, the exchange of real property, the renovations that take place, the maintenance of it, so on and so forth roughly equates to almost 20 to 25 percent of national gdp it is a major force economically speaking so my hope is is that if the housing market can stay relatively healthy through this whole thing it might actually help carry us through so that if we do dip into a recession perhaps it's not that deep and not that bad ken what do you think about that or am I, am I just the internal uh, optimist? <laughs> you're, you're muted there, Ken. You have to unmute your mic. Or not. There you go. Is it, is it muted? We got you now. 
So the question, Jeff, is how bad will the recession be? Yeah. Well, first is, do you think that a recession is definitely on the horizon? And second is, how deep and how long? So let's talk about the history of recessions. Um, and this is the longest period ever in U.S. history without a recession. So the last one was 2008, 2009, that period of the great financial crisis. And we've never gone a decade without a recession. Um, there's reasons for that. Let's just not get into the reasons right now. But we normally have one or two recessions every single decade going back 150 years uh, of data. Uh, recessions can be healthy. Um, it does weed out the excesses of uh, the economic expansion. And we've had an economic expansion that was built on more debt, more credit, low interest rates, and the Federal Reserve pumping money into the economy. So they always say the bigger the boom, the bigger the bust. And I got to tell you, the last 10 years is the biggest boom I have ever seen, A, for the stock market, definitely for the bond market. When I got in the business, bonds were yielding uh, 6 or 7%. They're now at zero. So bonds, when the interest rates come down, the price of the bond goes up. So the uh, Treasury bond performance year to date, two months, if you bought a, a, a longer dated Treasury bond, it's up 20%. You made 20% on your money year to date. There's no more yield in treasury bonds. So I don't expect uh, any rate of return out of bonds moving forward. So the recession, well, it's going to be liquidity and, and the financial markets. If they, if they seize up like 2008, we're going to have a recession like 2008. So the Fed dropping interest rates to zero, providing trillions of dollars worth of liquidity is trying to make sure that they don't repeat a 2008. I don't know if they can do that because they don't have the ammunition today to do it. When, if, you, if we go back to 2007, we had 5 or 6% interest rates. They were able to cut um, interest rates 5%. We only had 1.5% right. to go two weeks right. ago, so we don't have any stimulus right. that is going to you know, jumpstart the economy. They've, they've kind of fired all their bullets off. So that's what I'm most worried about is we don't have the stimulus and now it has to be from the fiscal side of the White House and they're already running a trillion dollar deficit. Right. Right. So Trump, you know, let's not talk, give names, but we have never in an economic expansion ran a trillion dollar deficit. And this administration, since they touched office, have been spending close to a trillion dollars that they don't bring in in tax receipts. Where are we going from that? You, you know, we're going to drop money out of helicopters now and give everybody a thousand dollars paycheck to the door. I don't know how they're going to run that, but it seems that the markets are a confidence game. If we start losing confidence in the markets and start understanding that they may not have bullets to fight this, that's what we have to stop. You know, and how do we stop that? We got to get the flatten of the curve on the coronavirus, right? Um, and stop people from panicking. My 25-year career, it's all about booms and busts and greed and fear driving people's decision. So I could turn these lemons into lemonade, meaning, you know, you're going to get some great investment opportunities moving forward if you know how to value assets. And when they get really, really cheap, you have to have enough capital in the sidelines to be able to purchase these. So do we? are we going to have a recession? <laughs> it's the longest period ever. Yes, we're going to have a recession. China's numbers just went down more than any time we've ever had in recorded history of China. And now if we shut down everything and people are working from homes and you can't go to um, stores and you can't go to restaurants, of course we're going to have a recession. It's just a matter of how bad it's going to be. Right. Right. Laura, any thoughts on that? Just um, in general? In general, well, um, as you stated before, we've survived 2008 and these types of environments before. We did it together. Um, I think one thing that I'm seeing is um, unlike the big cities, a lot of people are looking to maybe move to like a less densely populated area. So I think for what we have going for us, our proximity and our distance from the major city is going to be working in our favor. Um, from a lender's perspective, um, I got four accepted offers yesterday. Um, so I do see buyers are putting in offers and getting them accepted. And I've got three closings this week. So life is still you know, proceeding. Um, that being said, on the flip side, I do see some of the um, uh, evidence uh, of the banks really starting to tighten up. Um, talking about putting down, you know, three percent and zero percent. You know, those types of opportunities might shift slightly because, um, you know, with the lenders 
not being sure if the property values are going to be depreciating in the short right. term. We may be looking for larger down payments in the not so distant future, which is something that we need to consider. Um, but, you know, again, I do see the market as being very active and um, people still need a roof over their head. So it's a lot different than the commercial market that we were describing before, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, yeah. And Jeff, may I just say one more thing? It's Please. Just important. Uh, I've been getting inundated with phone calls for people with refinancing. Um, I closed 10 last month right before this, you know, uh, virus really became uh, at the level that it's at. Right now, banks do not want to refinance mortgages. Um, they are making decisions basically and pricing their refinances such that you're, they're basically pricing themselves out of the market so that they can just focus up the task at hand and uh, not compromise their portfolio with loans that maybe were questionable. So right. you know, if you want to refinance, you really do have to hold on until we get back to you. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's one of the one of the strengths, I think, um, over the last couple of years is the level of equity that are in homes, you know, in general. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of households don't have a mortgage on them. Um, a lot of households that do have a mortgage have a pretty low, low loan to value ratio. So that's, that's definitely, um, you know, been a positive as opposed to what you saw going into 2008, where it was just, you know, cash out refi, cash out refi, and people just, you know, taking the, the loans out. So, you know, I think that's a good thing that the banks are maybe uh, tampering down the refi, you know, those cash out refis right now, because, um, you know, they're just securing their balance sheets, basically. So, I mean, Ken, am I just foolish to think that the housing market being the strength of this, it was the thing that caused the 2008 financial collapse, but it's been really the thing that's carried the U.S. economy, I think, uh, to be in such a boom as opposed to the rest of the globe, you know, because the rest of the world hasn't necessarily had such a good run like we have in the U.S., um, is it a, a, say, a, a fair statement to say that the strength of the U.S. housing market might actually make this recession not hurt as bad as it did the last time? So I want to show you a chart, but I don't know if I want to show you the chart. Right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking at something that is the best indicator of valuation in residential housing. And there's a guy up at Yale and there's a guy down south. I forget where he is down south. Um, Emory or one of those. And you've probably heard of it. Um, Case Schiller yeah. Index. Yeah. And I'm looking at my screen, Jeff, at the Case Schiller. And I'm just bringing it back to 2000. I watched the housing bubble go up. And I don't know if you understand how this is calculated, but uh, it's pretty simple. Um, real estate in Warwick you can't buy the same house in Greenwich, Connecticut, right? You can't right. buy the same one down in Ridgewood, New Jersey. Uh, you can't buy the same square footage. It's a lot different. The denominator of that is the income of the town that you live in, right? A lot more people make a lot more money in Greenwich than they do in Warwick. So what he did was take the value of real estate divided by the average income. Do you know right now, when you look at this indicator, it is higher than 2007, 2008? We have a higher valuation of residential real estate than what they deem to be a housing bubble. We have lending of what, 5% money down? You're putting 5% down on a house? So we have banks that are giving out mortgages under 3%, right? With a cushion of 5%. What could go wrong there, Jeff? <laughs> if we have the highest indicator, it's telling me to get back to 100. So that's where he um, formulated the index. He just basically said, Here's the housing prices of the town. Here's the income. If the income goes up and housing doesn't go up, then the indicator goes down. But if housing goes up and incomes, the average income of the town does not rise, right? If our incomes were to rise 3 or 4% a year, if the companies were to give us a 3 or 4% raise every single year, then the, ind then the indicator would stay flat. Mm -hmm. But right now, what we've seen is the average person hasn't really made much more money Right? If, we, if we separate an 80-20 ratio of uh, Americans, 20% of Americans did get a lot richer with the stock market and the real estate market and everything else 
but, but I, our incomes you have worse. you have you have two things in play that I believe are are moving the needle on that analytic, and that is the fact that mortgage rates are so much lower than they were back then. All right, in two thousand seven and eight. And also, uh, you you have a serious and a real inventory shortage, right? Yep. That we did not have in two thousand seven and two thousand eight. So, you have both a, a liquidity situation that is driving price up, and you also have real supply and demand, which has driven the price of these real estate assets up. So, I think that that is a dip, there is a difference there, and. Yep. And I think that the fact that there is still so much demand, yet there's still not enough supply, I think that at the end of the day, it's economics 101, right, Ken? Supply so and let, demand. So let me address that because yeah. you're right. The interest rate is what the uh, what is the final arbiter of your decision. So if you have someone that shows up at the house, can I buy the house? Are they looking at the price of the house or are they looking at the monthly payment? Any real Well, a lot, of, a lot of people tend to look at price, but... I, as a realtor, and I always tell our realtors, it's, it has nothing to do with the price. It has everything to do with your monthly payment. Correct. Because people so, don't know, they can't conceptualize what price means. They understand, here's how much money I have, here's how much money I can spend. So my fear as a homeowner is this. If these policies were to turn against us, and you keep on printing money, and that turns into inflation, right? The more money, you know, historically, if you print money, it's supposed to be inflationary. But the way that they've been printing money is by giving it to the banking sector, not to Main Street, right? right. But if we change our policies, which a lot of politicians are talking about, and start helicopter dropping money on Main Street, my fear is that that's going to cause inflation. If inflation does rear its ugly head like the 1970s, we started at 2 or 3% in early 1970s, and we ended at double-digit inflation rates. We averaged 7% inflation for the decade. My fear is that they go overboard and they do too much trying to uh, you know, not let capitalism work, not right. let the free markets work, intervene right. and, and do too much. What happens if inflation went just to 5%? Well, we'd have to get government bonds above that level. You'd have to have a 6% treasury in order to stop that inflation. Where are we on mortgages? 7%. So go, you know, that, that's what I don't want happening, especially as a homeowner, but it's a possibility that they get this wrong because their policies, you know, I believe for the last decade or two have been to target asset prices, not to improve main street, not to improve our, um, incomes, right? We haven't really addressed the incoming inequality in this country. And that's the big, uh, debating point this day. If you listen to the presidential debates, it's income inequality. The rich got richer. And the middle class and the lower class did not participate as much as the rich. So if inflation came up, that's my worry about everything. I don't want, uh, you know, I don't know how many Laura, how many mortgages Laura could do at 7%, but that's, you know, that's what the normal mortgage was all through the 1990s. That would be highly deflationary for real estate prices exactly. and that's what we got that's what we got to avoid so interest rates drive majority of the price in power of all assets right. so they're trying to drive them down artificially and i just hope they don't snap back the other way you know that's i think what this whole thing is going to come down to is jobs you know at the end of the day if people have a job and they have the confidence that if they want to get another job they can um, they will feel confident enough to buy a home, you know? So the job market is another, it's another interesting discussion because it's been so tight now for the last couple of years. And a lot of employers have worked really hard to put the employees in place that they have. So how many layoffs are going to occur during this, you know, halting of movement, um, is going to be interesting. I, I'm hopeful that companies are going to try to hang on and cash flow this thing to the best of their ability. I know that's what we're doing here at Green Team. You know, everybody's working remotely. We're not dialing back on any of our staff. We're, you know, just trying to do more with, with what we can, you know. Um, and hopefully a lot of other businesses uh, fall in line with that too. So, you know. And that comes back to the stock market. And if you're a CEO or a CFO of a major corporation, you know, the biggest cost is your employ uh, employees. Yep. And when your stock plummeting and, and your earnings are probably going to go down, the first thing that they normally do, 
you know, is cut employees. So we're hoping right. that we could put something in place that stops the slide of the overall stock market, but we can't stop the decision makers at the top of these corporations that say, start laying people off. That, that would be the worst case scenario here that we don't want to get into. Um, but that's the first thing that they do in a recession. They start laying off employees if, the, if their revenues start going down and their earnings start going down. So, you know, obviously as a financial planner, we have to plan and say, hey, you should have nine months to a year worth of cash on the sidelines just for emergency expenses. So that's what I would tell people is start working and thinking that if you did uh, come into these circumstances, do you have enough liquidity at home to get through this? Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I think this was good for me. Um, I'm glad that everybody gave me their input. Um, just again, more information process, right? And that's what we're trying to do every month with the housing market update is just give you honest information so that you can make decisions for whatever it is that you're doing in your life. Um, the takeaway I think is if you're a seller worried about putting your home on the market because of everything that's going on right now for market reasons, you're crazy. You should get your home on the market and you should sell it because the market is very good and it's very robust still. And as, as we heard from Christy, Angela and Karen. Okay. Uh, and we don't know what the future holds. So why wait? What's the point of that? Now, if you're concerned because of health concerns because you're an at-risk person for this disease so on and so forth totally get it totally understand maybe find another way to work it maybe go somewhere else if you have the means to do it put the home on the market let it be vacant get a good realtor like one of our green team realtors like christy anderson angela murphy or karen going one of those three particularly <laughs> um but regardless of where you are you can find a great realtor this is what we do you know we're on the front lines dealing with this stuff all the time and i think if you're a buyer uh there may be some unique opportunities in this whole thing you know you you may find that by being courageous and going out there you may just find uh some deals that others may not be willing to do so um i think we have no choice but to keep going right folks what else are we going to do we can sit here and talk about it all day long or we can go sell homes <laughs> Jeff, can I interject for just a moment? Please, yeah. Um, I had a listing that my sellers were sitting on for a while. They were not sure, and I think I mentioned it in a couple of previous of our housing market uh, updates that we did. Um, we ended up extending the listing for another another month they needed to get themselves ready. I listed the house on Saturday morning, and by Sunday afternoon, I had three full price offers, and we're in attorney review. So. The good houses are still going. If you have a house listed now, it will be gone. You do have realtors such as Angela and Christy and I that are willing to go out there. We'll take whatever precaution is needed. We will sell your home and we will have buyers for your home. So have trust that we can get this done for you. Love it. I love it. Does anyone else want to add anything before we close it out? Well, I want to leave it, you know, the stock market, Jeff, on a positive note. Sure. You know, 2008, if we bring it back to 2008, you know, and you go and back and just look at your favorite companies where they traded from the lows to where they were. You're talking about some stocks that went up five, six, seven hundred percent. Yeah. So, what an opportunity, to, right? Yeah. To make, you know, some lemonade out of the lemons we're getting dealt. If the stock market does something like 2008, we're already down 30 something percent. Their stock's down 50 percent. Yeah. Now, as long as you got cash on the sidelines and you know that you want, you know, certain companies that you've been fans of. They may get to valuations that are going to help out your retirement. So right. you have to get yourself in a position that if this gets worse, that you're going to be able to buy. So I've never told people that, hey, have all your money in the stock market. If you had money in bonds, you can sell your bonds now that, you know, they basically have no yield left to them, probably no upside. And you could start looking at growing your wealth. I don't know if the bottom's in yet. You know, it's probably going to get factored in if we have the recession. But there's companies that are going to trade at great values that have already fallen 30, 40, 50 percent. If you're in a position to take advantage of that, you're going to have a better retirement because you're going to be able to grow your wealth faster. So that's the upside of, you know, what's happening in the stock market as long as you're positioned for it. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Right. I mean, Warren Buffett says buy fear. Right. When people are fearful, that's when you buy. So and one other is, thing. Go ahead, Laura. Um, you know, the other thing I'm thinking is with everybody in the house and everybody together as a family, there's homeschooling. I think a lot of people are going to look at their lives differently after this date and time. 
Um, I think that you're going to see families coming back. There's always a reason why there's catastrophic things that happen in our life and the shift. I personally believe that this shift is a good thing. Mm -hmm. I see families out holding hands, walking together, talking, reading books. And what is the heart of the family? It's their home. So I think for families, I think that they're going to be hugging themselves tighter. I think extended families are going to blend. I think people are going to be finding comfort in their own home. And there's nothing more important to the family than the roof that's holding over your head. So um, I think in that regard, in the community that we serve, I think that it's going to be good for our market in some regards. Very, very well said. So let's leave off on that note. After all, it is St. Patrick's Day. So hopefully everyone's got some <laughs> corned beef cooking in the crock pot. Got a green and, notebook. Yeah, some green beer or some Guinness or something like that I hanging out. So. Murph's, Murphy, you know, obviously we know she's involved in the Irish thing, right? Angela Murphy with green shirt. Love it. All right. So listen, guys, great panel, great discussion. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Let's do it again. Let's check in next month and see what the next month brings. Hopefully it's a little bit more on the positive side. All right. Have a good one, everybody. Bye. Uh, thank you. Take care. Thank you, Jeff. Bye. Thanks, Be Jeff. safe, everyone. You Bye -bye. too.